Welcome to the weekly broadcast of the Wolverhampton Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. We hope you enjoy our service and are encouraged. If you would like to know more about our church, please visit www.wolverhamptoncentralsda.org.uk. Happy Sabbath, greetings and salutations. Welcome everybody to our Sabbath school. Welcome to our Sabbath service. We're so glad that you could join us. We're happy that you're here. As always, if you have any comments during this Sabbath school, please feel free to put them in the YouTube chat or even on the Facebook chat, and we will endeavor to answer your questions that you put through to us. With me today, I'll let them introduce myself on my right. Good morning, everyone. I am Elder Mark Palmer. And I'm glad to be with you to, do, to go through God's word this morning. God bless you. And on my left. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Monroe, and I'm happy to assist in the study of this lesson today. Thank you. Now, for all those of you who don't know, let me just give you a, a, a heads up. We have different skills here. So Mark, Elder Palmer will give you the, the spiritual aspect. I will give you the practical aspect. Uh, uh, and Elder Monroe here will give you the amazing facts okay. aspect, the historical aspect. Just before we start, I'm going to ask Elder Palmer if he would pray for us. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, good morning, and thank you so much for allowing us to be with you, Lord, on this wonderful Sabbath day. We ask now, Lord, for the guidance of your Holy Spirit, our greatest teacher, and that he will speak to our hearts and speak to our minds. And from what you've given to us this week, may we pull out lessons that will help us to believe you, to trust you, and to see how great our God is. Stay with us now, Lord, and guide us in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Now, let me let you into a little secret. I am in love with words. When I was younger, one of my favorite things to do was read the dictionary. And I would just sit down and devour words and their meanings. And it all came from, from my school, my upbringing. Don't ask me when it comes to English language and English literature. They are my subjects. And not only was English language and English literature my subjects, also Latin was one of my subjects that I studied at school and excelled in. It's such a, a beautiful language. Really? And yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great language. It's a great language. <laughs> and when I was growing up, people would ask me, uh, it kind of it pervaded into every aspect of my life because people would ask me, you know, how do you fix, for instance, the video player? For those of you old enough to remember what a video player is. And it wasn't so much that I was good at fixing video players it's just that i wanted to read the manual because i was i was so in love with words and then i got into studying the bible and we come to this week's lesson mm -hmm. and this week's lesson just talks about words and as you can see i'm very excited because this is just my passion i want to know what the etymology is the meaning of the words I, I'm just so excited to start. And they have put me in front of this plinth here, hoping that I won't move. Um, but that's not going to work today because I'm going to take the mic and I'm going to move about because I kind of feel a little bit restricted. So before we start and get into the lesson, I want to ask you at home, wherever you are, the lesson title for this week is called an everlasting covenant. Now, while we read the scripture reading shortly, I want you to type in the chat and I want you to tell me what is a covenant. So I'll give you a little while to put that in the chat. What is a covenant? As we here begin to read the, the memory verse, I'm going to ask Paul if he would mind reading the memory verse, which is Genesis <clears throat> 17 and verse 7. Genesis 17 and verse 7. This is from the Revised Standard Version that we have in our quarterlies. 
I, who is God, will establish my covenant between me and you, which is Abraham, and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. So, thank you for that re scripture reading there. God is going to establish an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his descendants. So in order to pick apart the lesson, we need to understand, as I said, what does covenant mean? What is a covenant? If you put your, as I said, if you put your comments in the YouTube or the Facebook chat, I'll be able to see them on screen here or on the screen in front of me, and we'll pick up on some of your ideas. But before we even take yours, I'm going to ask Mark, what is a covenant? A covenant is a, is a promise to an individual or individuals. It's, a, it's, a, it's an arrangement made not so much because you've done anything that's right or wrong. Okay, okay, okay. Before you go there, before you go there, okay. okay. That's a godly covenant. In terms of today, a, a what is a covenant? More of a, contra a contract. More of okay. a contract. Yeah. Sister Lorna White, thank you. Sister Chelsea Smith, I can see you've put on here an agreement. Mm -hmm. And a covenant agreement is made between God and man. And an agreement between more than one person. But as Elder Palmer alluded to, that may not strictly be the truth in terms of God's covenant mm -hmm. with Abraham. So go ahead what you were saying now in terms of a godly covenant. So a godly covenant isn't something that you've actually earned mm -hmm. or even something you deserve, but God actually gives it to you for a purpose, for a reason. It isn't just for you, but for everybody else who will come after you. So God pinpoints, you may get a covenant with Paul, for example. He'll pinpoint Paul and say, Paul, my covenant is with you for this reason, and from that will come the following, A, B, C, D, and E. And as long as Paul complies with God's expectations, the covenant will come through. Okay, okay. So Elder Palmer has gone deeper and said that this covenant is not so much an agreement per se, because usually when you write a contract, mm -hmm. both parties come together, they decide on the contract, decide what's going to be in it, and then they both put their names to it. But here we see in a godly covenant, a godly covenant, that the person who presents this contract and writes the contract is God. Mm -hmm. And then he decides to give that to Abraham. Now I'm going to ask Elder, uh, Elder Paul, what was the need for a covenant? Why, why was there a need for a covenant? There's a need for a covenant because man sinned. Yeah. And, and man has gone away from God's ideal, gone away from God. And because of sin, God needs that covenant to come into being because he's the method of, of our salvation while we are saved. So the, the covenant is a method of salvation, how we're going to be saved. You see, that deepens what we've said earlier because if man was party to the agreement and helped write that contract, then he would, man would have dictated the way That's right. in which he was going to be saved. But because man can't save themselves, mm -hmm. it had to be God that wrote the covenant, wrote up the terms and conditions and then presented it to man. Now, if there's anybody that disagrees and thinks I'm talking off the top of my head, please go ahead and put your comments in the chat, as I said, and we'll, and we'll see how we can discuss that and, and take that further. I'll, I'll just establish that by scripture, because really in um, Revelation 13, verse 8, it tells us of the lamb that was slain mm -hmm. from the foundation. That's and, right. and so therefore the decision that Jesus would come and would save us was made before anything was made. 
And, and, and so we see that God's um, promises, because you can have covenant. I'm just looking at the general covenant that God is making to us. But obviously there are um, individual covenants also that God makes. But it was through Abraham or through mm -hmm. Abraham's seed mm -hmm. was the promise of the one who would come. And so that's why it's important that, you know, that God's making this covenant with Abraham um, or Abraham um, at this particular time. And to establish this great name is because through him, this seed would come, and that seed was Christ. That's the important part. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Chelsea Smith. She agrees with me. Good morning, Janoy Barrett. Thank you for joining us from, from the United States, as usual. Good morning, Janoy. Thank morning. you for joining us, Lorna White, and also Good Tracy morning. Philpot. Good morning. By all Good means, morning. continue to put your comments in, and, and, and we will read them out for you. I'm going to move on to. Sunday's lesson, if you don't mind. Okay, yeah. Yahweh and the Abrahamic covenant. So first of all, we've discussed what covenant, what a godly covenant is, like a man-made man covenant, but what a godly covenant is. And we've also established the reason why a covenant was made. Under Sunday's lesson, Genesis 15 Verse 7. Genesis 15 and verse 7. If anybody could read that for me. Genesis 15 and verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur and of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit. Okay. So when we read that, when, when, when we read that, we understand that that is God. However, the English language is not as perfect or precise as, I, as it could be. Let me give you an example. If I say, I love ackee and saltfish, you understand that that really means I like ackee and saltfish. If I say I love my family, then we understand that the word love can mean two different things depending on its context. Would that be correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the English language isn't that precise. So when you read in Genesis, verse, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 7 and it says, I am the Lord, in, depending on what... Um, version of the Bible you have, which translation, that word Lord should be in all capital letters. Should be in all capital letters. When you go to the very, very front of the Bible now, in the introduction, or even in the concordance, it will actually tell you that that word Lord means is actually the Hebrew word Yahweh. We have put some vowels in it just to make it easier to pronounce. Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E but realistically, that's not how it's spelt. Paul, how, how's it spelt? Y-H-W-H. -H. So we've actually put in extra vowels just to make it easier for the English speaking ones among us to be able to pronounce that word i, I, sh I should go ahead just add um the way the um bible writers kind of not kind of wrote the, the, they would not pronounce the word the name of god mm -hmm. it was so holy, so holy that's right so that's they wouldn't right. they wouldn't want to pronounce it and it was even sort of difficult to decide upon how is it i mean this is god speaking anyway mm -hmm. so they, they can use what the translation of this is to say well We'll put this down, but the thought that God's name was so holy that it, you know we couldn't be couldn't be spoken. Mm -hmm. I just thought I'd just add that in yeah, in yeah. a second. So when you go further down into the lesson, thank you, Paul. When you go further down into the lesson, it's broken down as to what Yahweh means, and it states that Yahweh means the self-existent one or the self-sufficient one, the everlasting one. Because what here God is trying to portray to Abraham is who he is. 
who he is. Today we give our children names and a lot of the time it doesn't really mean anything. I have no idea why my mum decided to call me Simon. Simon, Simon Templar. <laughs> I don't know about Simon Peter. If it was left to my dad, he would have called me Seymour. Thank you, mum. Is that a girl's name? <laughs> <laughs> but in Bible days, the name represented a character. A characteristic, that's right. Or a characteristic. It represented who you were, what you were to become, or it represented something which happened at that particular time. For instance, when we read the name Methuselah, we know it means, and when this person comes, and then shall the end dies. come. When he dies. When he dies, yeah. sorry, and then yeah. the end shall come, signifying the flood. So, 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 so go ahead. The idea of, of the name then usually links to a characteristic, mm -hmm. yeah, as he rightly said. So your name mm -hmm. in the Hebrew mm -hmm. means listen. Mm -hmm. Paul's name yes. in the Hebrew and Latin, I believe, mm -hmm. means humble. Mm -hmm. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> My okay. name okay. I, in the Greek means God of war. Well, we understand, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when you think about it, names like Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. it conjures up a certain person. Mother Teresa, a certain person. Muhammad Ali, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. it conjures up a certain characteristic. And even the name Judas. Now, many people, well, I don't think we're calling the, the, the child mm. Judas. Or Jezebel. Or, or Jezebel, yes, okay. at the end of the day. But I apologize to anybody who happens to, say. to be <laughs> Judas or Jezebel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes it conjures up certain, certain connotations. Yes, those kind of words do. So we link certain names to certain characteristics mm -hmm. or achievements, and it stands out for us. Mm -hmm. And therefore, God himself, with, as, as Paul and yourself mentioned, has these names to signify what is his character about, what, mm -hmm. is he, what does he mean, what is he trying to, trying to translate to you and I mm -hmm. as part of the covenant, and by knowing his name, understanding his name, it gives us a picture of who this person God is. Amen. 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 Can can I go ahead? Not add, but just kind of move on to something else because um, something came to my mind as we're here, and it says it said unto him, "I am the Lord um, Yahweh mm -hmm. that brought thee out of Ur." Right, and it's like something similar that we see what happens in the future, when the future from this, mm -hmm. in so much that when God took out the Israelites from Egypt, he, re he said again, you know, I am God who brought you out. Mm -hmm. So God is recognizing that or, or establishing that he is the one, you know, that That's was right. speaking directly, but who, who is he identifying with here? And so what I was thinking, right, is that, is all this happening in, in, a, va in a vacuum of God mm. just suddenly getting up and speaking to, um, to Abraham? Abraham. But, mm -hmm. but it's not, right? And the reason why I say it's not, it's because that um, Abraham, well, if you look at the genealogy in Genesis chapter 10 mm -hmm. and also Genesis chapter 11, really, as well, at the start of Abraham, um, Abraham was um, alive at the same time as Shem, mm -hmm. they would have coexisted mm -hmm. yeah. together. And, and what you find happened is that in Genesis chapter 10, um, that these people must have believed the story of Shem mm -hmm. because they could see the evidence of mm -hmm. a universal flood yeah. all around them. And even though they didn't want to give themselves to God, mm -hmm. they said, let us build a tower. So if this happens again, we can be safe. Mm -hmm. So they believed that the story that Shem and, and Noah had spoken of, that the world was destroyed, and this is how it was destroyed. Mm -hmm. But yet when you get to Terah, Abraham's father, you see that they were turning themselves away, and even his father worshipped idols and, and, and so forth. And so what I'm saying is there was evidence there that God existed. Yeah. And so he didn't just call Abraham yeah, I, I just appeared to him, just speak to him, and Abraham mm -hmm. believed. Abraham also saw the evidence, and then 
But because he had that relationship with God, because he chose to keep the religion of, uh, of Shem, mm -hmm. you know, they all from the same, same lineage. Mm -hmm. <coughs> then when God revealed, he recognized. And so God spoke to him personally. And, and as, you know, as I'm speaking to you, God spoke to him. So in that context, God calls him out. And we're saying, who is now going back to what, what uh, Elder, Elder Mark is saying, mm -hmm. the character of God is now being, being revealed, mm. that he is Yahweh, the self-existing. He's mm -hmm. identifying himself, mm -hmm. you know, before anything was me. Mm -hmm. That's cool. You know, and, and, and so he's identifying himself to, to, to Abraham and saying what I say, is is yeah. it you yeah. know what i mean yeah. and so he's prepared to listen which is also you mentioned in terms of he also said to the children of israel after they came out of egypt as well and we we understand this because the children of israel in egypt had almost forgotten who god was mm. that's right yeah because they had been in captivity in for long. 400 years yeah. who is god yeah and so when um, God announces himself, I am that I am. He's actually saying, listen, I am the self-sufficient one. I am the eternal one, the, ev the, the existing one. Who was at the beginning? Mm. It was me who created. And if I created at the beginning, then surely I can take you out of the land where you are now. Mm -hmm. So he had to set a president. So when you read that word, Lord, don't just read it as I am the Lord when next time you come to read it and you see it in capitals and if you're in a struggle if you are in a way which you think yeah, you yeah. can't get out of mm -hmm. when you read that scripture understand that that is god saying listen i am the self-sufficient one i am the ex the eternal existing one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point and when okay, so on, okay go, ahead, go ahead and also i think it hits me the most that why would this self-existing, self-supreme, all-powerful God make a covenant with a man called Abraham? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why would he take time out after we've messed up? Mm -hmm. Why would God do that? Well, I think we're going to move. I think I, we're going to come on to it in, in one day's yeah, lesson. Yeah, because I, I was just think. I was going to say he doesn't make because we look at Genesis chapter twelve. Mm -hmm. And you see that God has made the, the covenant to Abraham. Yeah. And he was 75 years old when he, when yeah. he, when he left um, um, Ur, mm -hmm. which is a region around where the Pope went the other day um, to, um, in, in Turkey. To, to, so anyway, never mind that. <laughs> 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 and so God makes a promise to him in Genesis chapter 12. 12 but, yeah. but then that same promise that God is making to him, you know, you know, who has a child, you know, well, 75, never mind. But I mean, obviously, it was, it was, he was 99 when God comes. So God appears to him several times repeating mm -hmm. this covenant, repeating his promise. And it seems out of the impossible, it becomes possible. That's right. And I think that's yeah. something that we can remember mm -hmm. as yes. well as, yeah. as God's children, that when things seem impossible to us, mm -hmm. it is always, always possible, possible for God. God. Yeah. 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 Good morning, Nathaniel. Good morning, Norma. Shan, I can see you've written here, a covenant is an agreement of promise if kept through obedience, yeah. which brings you into a relationship. Thank you very much for your comments. Keep them coming in. I'm going to... I just wanted to make a technical uh, point in a sense. Um, when, we, when you read your Bible and you see the word, as Simon mentioned earlier, in capitals, um, L-O-R-D, Lord, it's, it's, it, it means Yahweh. But also mm -hmm. you see it in smaller casing in the, throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. I think in Genesis 18, um, I can't remember what verse it's used there. And when Sarah, was, you know, when Sarah laughed and That's then right. she said, my Lord, blah, 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 blah. And so it's used in smaller casing there. And it's the word Adonai. So when you see it in smaller casing, mm -hmm. it, which translates to master, um, it's slightly different, different than when you see it in capitals where, it's, where it means Yahweh. I've got a question for you later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to move on to um, Monday's lesson, El Shaddai. And God has a habit, as I said, the English language is very imperfect in, in the translation. 
And this, and, and God always is introducing himself and explaining his characteristics to people. So, in Monday's lesson, it talks about El Shaddai. Now, that can, there's no precise translation for El Shaddai. But it can be translated in many ways. It can be translated as um, Almighty. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. God Almighty. Yeah. And it also can be translated as the um, Sufficient One. Mm -hmm. And I think in Abraham's case, I, because, it, because it's very unclear, we kind of like have to take the context in which it was written to understand what perhaps it meant in this particular scenario. So when we look at the historical context, God comes to Abraham, El Shaddai, and God introduces himself as, I am the sufficient one. And he tells Abraham, or Abram at that time, I am going to make a nation out of your seed. So God is actually saying, I, God, the sufficient one, is sufficient enough to make a promised seed and a mighty nation from your offspring. It's interesting because Abraham doesn't, or Sarah, doesn't believe God. And so what they do is, and Sarah... I was going to add, and nor did, it, nor did Abraham. Yeah, and Abraham, yeah. <laughs> and Sarah says to Abraham, well, you know, look how old I am can't give children. So what I want you to do, Abraham, is I want you to take my handmaid, Hagar, and have a child with Hagar, and then this child will be the mighty nation. But God had already explained to Abraham that I'm the sufficient one. So whatever you need, I have the power to be able to supply it. Now, we asked a, a question earlier before we, we, we came on screen. So I asked Paul, how many siblings do you have? My, um, my brothers and my sisters. Mm -hmm. Well, I have one brother. and mm -hmm. Well, I said four sisters, but one of them's passed. Okay. Mark? Two brothers, three sisters. Mm -hmm. And in total for me, there's six. And the Bible also says, blessed is the man whose quiver... He's full. He's full of them. Children. So I'm going to ask you a question. How many children did Abraham have? How many children did Abraham have? I'll be looking on here. Um, I'll be looking on here. And while, we'll, while you're, I'm looking at that, I have seen a question here, which we may be able to answer later. The question is... So if Yahweh is the true name of God, does that mean Jesus' true name is Yeshua? Yeshua? Is that where it comes from? So, sorry, I'm, I was reading. Say that again, sorry. A uh, question from Christine. If Yahweh is the true name of God, does that mean Jesus' true name is Yeshua? Is that where it comes from? So I'll explain the first part again in terms of the name Yahweh. We said at the very beginning, Christine, that... A name can be a characteristic. It can relate to something that happened, a major event, i.e. like Methuselah. Now, God is, is God, and there's no one word that yeah. could describe him. Can I jump in there? Go ahead. Yeah. Because um, what, what, we, what we're dealing with really is the name for God. Mm -hmm. And so the name for God is Yahweh. Yahweh. This, is, this is how he identifies himself. Um, when we come to the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. the name Jesus actually means, you know, salvation. salvation. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, a translation of that, this is where we come to Yahshua. 
So that's the difference between um, the two. One is talking about the name of God and, and, the, and the name, what we call Jesus, translated to the Hebrew means God saves. And so that's where we get the name Yeshua for, mm. Yeshua from. So that is reserved for Jesus. Because it is. Right, but that's the, well, I won't ask you the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will ask you the question. It's a, it's, yeah, ahead, I'm gonna ask ahead, you the go question. Ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. So go who, ahead. you know, who appears to Moses? Who appears to Abraham? That's my question. Okay, so a question to, well, first of all, Christine, I hope that answers your question. And then the Apostle Paul has put out another <laughs> question. Who appears Who's to it? Moses? And I'm going to answer my own question as well. Who appears to Abraham? Abraham. Yeah. Who appeared to Jacob? You can name them all. Yeah? Who wrestled with Jacob? Mm hmm. You can answer. Go ahead. Yeah, well. Jesus. Thank you. So, you answer, so the evidence Jesus. is what we find in John chapter 8, when Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, I think it's in verse 56, and he qu quotes um, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, and he said, because when, when Abraham, um, when Moses was saying, who, who are you, who am I? Who sent me? I am, yes. that I am, or I am, mm -hmm. who I am. And so Jesus says to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. I am. I am. So he's making a reference that it was him mm. that was speaking to Moses, and this is why they got upset. And so, who do you think you are? So it's an example where the um, interaction between mankind and God mm -hmm. is always represented through mm -hmm. Jesus, but the Father is there also, yeah. because um, if you notice in Exodus chapter twenty. With the word God that is used there in Exodus chapter 20 is Elohim, mm -hmm. which is the same what you find in Genesis chapter 1. Mm -hmm. And we know that was a combination of the Father, the Son, and, you know, bringing to the, this world. Even though Jesus spoke, it was them working together that brought this world into being. And so we see uh, when the commandments was given that the Father must have been there because mm -hmm. we're talking about Elohim and, uh, and Jesus and the Spirit. And so it was manifested physically through the fire and the thunder and the lightning that appeared on top of, of Mount Sinai. That was my question and I answered it as well. Okay, thank <laughs> you. So the que other question that I posed was, how many children did Abraham have? I haven't seen any answers. Thank you, Sister Christine. <laughs> Am I talking too much? <laughs> no, 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 go, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I just counted them. And I okay, so before you count them, before you... <laughs> Some people are going to say that he had two children. Two. Some people are going to say that he had one. one. And some people are going to say, as Paul is going, going to say, <laughs> Paul, you're going to say, well, if you turn six. to <coughs> the six, well, I'm counting them all together. I'm saying eight, because if you turn to um, Genesis 25, after Sarah died, um, Abraham took another wife. And her mm. name was Keturah. And there's four people listed as Abraham's children in verse, in verse 2. So, did I say, yes. Is it four? Yeah, one, two, three. Hold on, sorry. Six. So, therefore, with Ishmael and, um, and Isaac. There you go, Simon. So, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying. Oh, what, what are you saying? What are you saying? <laughs> In context of the covenant, uh -huh. we're talking about one. Yeah. In context of the covenant, uh -huh. we're talking about one in this case, when it uh -huh. comes to this study itself. Because what was Abram told? Through your seed will all nations be blessed. Uh -huh. And who was the seed talking about? It's the seed that he put up on the altar to, to, to actually sacrifice mm -hmm. unto God. Mm -hmm. So in, 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 in context of the covenant itself, Talking about one, but Paul's right, there are six. Okay, but in this eight. case, Sorry. it goes through one. Sister Chelsea says eight, so if you count eight. in total, yeah. eight. Okay, yeah. Sister Chelsea. Yeah. Chelsea, so eight. Yeah, that's what I was eight. Saying. The answer is physical children, eight, eight, which is correct, Sister Chelsea. However, as Mark says, in regards to covenant, one. Yeah, because he's described... How do we know that? Because he's described as the only begotten. That's, That's right. right. The Bible says, 22. God says to Abraham, 
take, take your me. only mm -hmm. begotten child, your only child, Isaac. There are three times he, he, he doesn't leave the chance. The scripture says, take your child, your only child, Isaac. So God specifies who it is. And God says, go and sacrifice that one. Because God said that he is going to make a mighty nation out of your seed through Isaac. Isaac only. Now, normally, we would, as I said earlier, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them when the Bible refers to children. But, and normally, you would say that if I have lots of children, mm. then by just pure maths, that my children would have children, would have children, would have children. Mm. So my seed, my generations is going to become large because I have lots of children. Mm. But in this respect, God already said he's a sufficient one. Regardless of what age you are, Regardless of what you think, I am going to produce a mighty nation through one child, and that is Isaac. Yeah. So again, if you're ever going through trouble, <clears throat> and you think and you may only have one pound, or one thing, or one talent, God is sufficient enough to bless that one talent, to multiply it, and do what it will do according to what he says. Which is why he says, mm. I am self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm. And it's also quite interesting that how God uses the word to Abraham, take your only begotten son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that same begotten is used where? Again, later on? Mm -hmm. For Jesus. For Jesus Christ, yeah. yeah? Here's my begotten son, mm -hmm. who, who I'm well pleased. Mm -hmm. So we see that both things come together. Isaac, the heir of the promise, and the, and the outcome of the promise, which is Jesus Christ, both mm -hmm. of them are called begotten. Mm -hmm. And it shows you how precious both of those individuals were in the plan of salvation for us, because mm -hmm. it comes down to you and I here in 21st mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. On the Tuesday, I can see comments coming in that one heir out of one nation, the nation of promise. Thank you very much for your comments. We've seen them, we're acknowledging them. Thank you for contributing. On the Tuesday's lesson, mm -hmm. again, because it's doing with names, I already put my disclaimer at the beginning. I love names, I love the etymology, etc. So. Uh, Excuse yeah. me. Etymology. <laughs> Abram to Abraham. Mm. Characteristic changed. A characteristic changed. What does the name Abram mean? The exalted father or father of the exalted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it now moves to Abraham. Mm. Why, why was the change? When was the change? Uh, uh, when was the change? What, what, two questions. Why was the change and when was the change? Well, like I said, God called Abraham from Ur when he was 75 years mm -hmm. old. And now nearly 25 years later, after making that promise, then it hasn't yet materialized. Mm -hmm. So again, God is reaffirming Abraham that he is God. Mm -hmm. So are you going to ask Mark what Abraham means? <laughs> Nations. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Father of nations. He oh. extended the name and extended his territory at the same time. The Father of nations. Mm -hmm. And when we have a new name for ourselves, mm -hmm. which we will. remember, when we have a for ourselves, God says that everything that on earth belongs to us. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, what it's saying in John 14, in my Father's house of what? Are many mansions. Mm -hmm. So when we become born in Christ again, everything becomes ours. Mm -hmm. And the promise made to Abraham back then means me and you and Paul and everybody in this building and everybody on this forum. The world belongs to God. We are God's children. The promise means it's for you and I today. So are you saying then that we are the fulfillment of the promise Most definitely. that God made to Abraham? Most definitely. Okay. But I would say also that God is very particular in calling a, a special people for a special time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was through the nation of Israel mm -hmm. at that time that you know, God was gonna declare his character mm -hmm. uh, if they were obedient to him. Yeah. 
And yeah. so in going back to Genesis 15, mm -hmm. sorry, um, you see God making a covenant um, with, with, um, with Abraham. And he tells Abraham to get a, a three-year-old three hive for a, a ram, a goat, a turtle dove, and cut them into pieces, mm -hmm. or divide them. This is just well. This was a, a method of of the way they used to make a covenant. Uh, the only other example like that is found in in Jeremiah, Jeremiah thirty-four verse eighteen, mm -hmm. and it, you see it happened there as also. And so when people were making agreements, a covenant that um, they both adhere to, that's what they would do. That's the ancient way of doing it. But God put him in a deep sleep, and during that deep sleep. God appears and speaks to him, but consumes that. Mm -hmm. And he tells him that his people, that's why I said that God has said that through his seed, especially at that time, um, were the Israelites, um, because he says that they're going to be taken into captivity, they're going to be served, but he would later free them. Mm -hmm. And he told them mm -hmm. when he would do it. So he said that, you know, 400 years, they're going to be in captivity, but I'm going to be their God, and I'm going to release them. And so God shows, because you're <laughs> right, it means us as well, that when we adhere to his covenant, is we get a, folks, we get a, 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 a abundance of blessings yeah. mm -hmm. that God has promised to, when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake. We can believe it because we've seen it in the past, how mm -hmm. he delivered them out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. He says he will do the same thing for us. Yeah, yeah. And so, you can add what you want. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The blessings that we receive from God isn't necessarily only about physical blessings that's right no. remember remember the blessings is about a transformation of our characters to be like god ultimately because mm -hmm. our role is to show forth the praise of him who caused us adopt into marvelous light mm -hmm. so the reason why god also blesses us is to maintain his character on the earth and to draw all men unto the one who is the blessing so i said to people in the end of the day that who is greater the one with the gift or the giver of the gift it has to be the, the giver, giver of the gift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, whatever we do, whatever we receive from God, it's about how can we draw people back to the source who is called self-sufficient, all-exalted mm -hmm. one at all times. Yeah. I'm just reading a comment here, and we did bring this up in our pre-deliberation. Nathaniel, it says, but God said he would make the servant's son with Abraham a great nation too. Mm -hmm. You are quite oh, correct. Mm -hmm. God did say that. However, the promise That's came through I Isaac. came through Isaac. The problem is, is that God told Abraham he was a self-sufficient one. He would do it. Abraham and Sarah decided that they would do something themselves. Now, anytime we try to help God, it we mess up. It. Mm. it doesn't need our help. Anytime we try and help God, we mess up. And you look at that through all the patriarchs, any time we happen with Lot, mm. it happened with Moses, any time they try and help God, something goes wrong. Uh, the Bible says that um, Jacob, the older, would serve the younger, Jacob and Esau. Mm -hmm. Jacob tried to take that promise beforehand, before it was right to be given to him, and look how much trouble it caused. And his name was you. Oh, what? Supplanter? Jack meant the supplanter, supplanter uh -huh. yeah. but his name was changed later. <laughs> okay. So you are quite correct, Nathaniel, but that the reason why the promise didn't come through Ishmael, because that was man trying to help God, but God doesn't need it. God doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help. No, I was just going to make another point about name changing and mm -hmm. so forth, because we, we focus on Abraham and Abraham's name being changed, mm -hmm. uh, meaning father of many nations but Sarah's name was also changed that's right. yes that's right and, right mm -hmm. and so I didn't know this so I looked it up but her name was just meant wife of Abraham but when you change it to S-A-R-A-H it actually means princess of Abraham but she was in her 90s <laughs> she was in her 90s when God did this you know what I mean and calling her a princess and and that was because I think if you go back to um, Genesis and you see um, Cain, when Cain killed Abel, you know, first Eve says, because she recognized the promise that God made that, you know, he's going to save them. Mm. You know, he's going to put enmity between, you know, the, 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 the serpent and, and her, you know, and, and his seed. And so that promise that she made, she saw the reality of, of the savior being born through her. And so she calls Seth means an anointed one. 
God has sent me another seed. Through him, you know, the, the promise of the Savior is going to come. And so we see that also, even with, 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 um, with um, Sarah, that through her, the promise is good. That's why she's called a princess, because she's, she's royalty. <laughs> because through her, you know, Christ is going to come. come. And the age does not restrict God's sufficiency. That's right. And that's important for us remember this morning. Your <clears throat> age does not mean it's over. When God's involved in your life, the all-sufficient one, everything becomes possible. Despite what we may see as man, God says your age doesn't preclude it. So those of you out there who think life's over, I won't get anywhere with life, my studies. Can't get a job. Can't get a job <laughs> and so forth. No, we are dealing with the self-sufficient one who can give you whatever he pleases, any time he pleases. And that's why this is so important for us this morning to remember he knows what he's doing and he'll do it in his own space and in his own time. Why? Because he's God alone. Amen. Question to the class at home. It's not for answering today, but just uh, I just want to put it out to you. We see in the lesson... Um, and, and we hear the word now, Semitic. So usually we hear it in the terms of anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Question for the class, not to be answered now, but you, if you want to put it in the, in, in the chat. Where does the word Semitic come from? Why is it suddenly anti-Semitic, etc.? Where does that name come from? If you study the genealogy, you will work out where and why. So that's just a, uh, a, a question for the class later, because I'm just so interested in words. On the Wednesday's lesson, on the Wednesday's lesson, it says in Genesis 12, verse 1 and 2. Somebody read for me Genesis 12, verse 1 and 2. Genesis 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, okay. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, mm -hmm. Get thee out of thy country. Mm -hmm and from thy kindred, mm -hmm. and from thy father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, mm -hmm. and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, mm -hmm. and thou shalt be a blessing. Okay, so the first thing is, in the stages of this, is any time God wants you to do something, you can't stay in the place where you are. That's right. You have to move. That's right. You have to... Faith never comes without some kind of action. And you know, I, how many times have you done this? You go into a room, you hit the light switch, the light doesn't come on, but then you flick it back off again and flick it back on, thinking that it's going to come, come on, on again. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that the bulb is gone. But you do it a few times just to check. Mm -hmm. Because you have faith in that that electric will sizzle through the wires and come on. That's what faith is, doing something. You cannot have faith without an action to say that I have a belief in something. And the first stage of the covenant is... Get up. Get up and do something. Get up. Get up. You have to go... Uh, am, am I correct or...? Yeah. Faith without works is dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll say that. And the beauty of it is that when God said to him, get up, mm -hmm. he had no idea... Where he was going. Where he was going. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's correct. It doesn't tell you where. It doesn't tell you where. Yeah. But he believed this person called the mm -hmm. all-sufficient one. Mm -hmm. So when God speaks to us, and, sp and he will speak to us, even though he don't understand, mm -hmm. get up. Mm -hmm. just get up. Just move. And let's see where the journey takes you. Mm -hmm. If you can turn to Genesis 15, 7 to 18. Genesis 15, verses 7 to 18. All of the chapter. Yeah, After you, Mark. Back, back to your thoughts. <laughs> After, <laughs> you. <laughs> After you, Mark. Okay. <laughs> no bullet, and bullet, he don't said you some bullet points out of that side. Unto him, and the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? I said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the bird divided he not. Uh -huh. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram Abraham drove them away. 
And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, or Abraham, sorry, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, mm -hmm. and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Mm -hmm. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Okay, just stay there, just stay there for a second. The Bible says that they were to have a sacrifice and then they were to pass between the sacrifice symbolizing obedience. So the first stage in the promise is if God tells you to go, go. go. The second stage in the promise is obedience. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine I want to go to London and I want to jump on the train track to go to London. The lines have to go to London. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Correct. If I depart and come off the train track, you am might, I going to get there? You might go somewhere else. So obedience is like those train tracks. Mm. If you want to reach the destination where God tells you to go, yeah. then you have to be obedient. Yeah. Stay on the track. That's what he's saying. And anytime mm. you depart from that, you may fall, but God is able to put you back on track to get to where you need to go. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. yeah. Can I just add a little go ahead. bit? Yeah, I'll just thinking that it's just an expression of love you know God is telling us what to do mm -hmm. in order to save us mm. and in our expression of love back to God you know he said if you know John 14 if you love me keep my, my keep my commandments mm -hmm. so that's in essence what he's telling us to do be obedient to God because he knows better and because he loves us and if we truly love God we don't keep our commandments we don't keep God's commandments because in keeping them, we've got to be saved. Mm -hmm. We keep them because we love him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then the final part of the promise, the final part of the promise, or the covenant, I should say, is the promise that God makes to Abraham. Verse 18. Yeah. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, unto thy seed mm -hmm. have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the river, River Euphrates. Mm -hmm. So there's a promise that there's a difference between the promises that God makes and the promises that we make. Mm -hmm. Remember, we already said that God came as El Shaddai mm -hmm. to Abraham. Now, I may promise that I have a thousand pounds in the bank. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I may say to you, Mark, I'm going to give you a thousand pounds. So when I get when we leave here, I'm going to go to the bank, draw a thousand pounds and give you. Yeah. But when I get there, the bank machine may have broke down. Mm -hmm. The money may have been taken elsewhere. Mm -hmm. There are any number of things that can happen. So I actually don't have the ability realistically to keep that to promise that. Yeah. or to fulfill that promise. But El Shaddai mm. being the sufficient one, he is able to not only say the promise, but he's also able and faithful to be able to keep that promise can I, can as I well go ahead add a little thing in there <coughs> it's only that because ex, um, genesis chapter 15 and god making this promise and and uh, and then accepting by um you know walking through the the midst of the sacrifice that abraham laid down mm -hmm. as of a, a burning furnace mm -hmm. you you see the fulfillment of that because like i said god said that he your people's got to go into captivity, they've got to serve strangers. Before but when you turn end. to Exodus chapter 6, mm -hmm. God specifically tells Moses to do something. He says, take the burning ashes um, from the um, furnace and throw them in the air. Mm -hmm. And so this was a symbol, symbol of the covenant that he had made with Abraham. Yeah. And that his people seem that no way this is going to be a great nation, even though there was a couple of million at the time. Mm -hmm. But God was fulfilling his promise. And at that particular point, his people were going to leave Egypt, no matter what Pharaoh no matter had what said. Happened. No matter what Pharaoh had no said. No matter what Pharaoh had That's said. That's the key point. Right. 
You run out of time. We run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> we have run out of time, oh, wow. unfortunately. It just went so quickly, didn't realize. We didn't manage to get through all of it. However, I hope that you are able to get something from we, from what was put forward. From my perspective, I hope it encourages you to study a little more and study the words in what, uh, in what the Bible says. And I pray that lives will be changed. And we're not talking about anybody else's life, just your life. Because if you change yours, then that reflects to somebody else. So we've come to the end. You pray to open. Yeah. I'm asking if you can pray to close. No problem at all. Okay. Could we just bow our heads? Dear Father, we just want to be thankful for the Sabbath. We're thankful for the time that we've spent discuss discussing your word. Lord, hide your word in our hearts that we might mm. not sin against you and help us to hold on to the covenants that you've first made with others and make with us also. Help us to be saved in your kingdom for our cease things in your holy name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thank you. Good morning, and once again, happy Sabbath to you all. Let me ask you a short question. Is your prayer life what it should be? Do you perhaps sometimes feel that like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling, coming back down? Do you wonder if God is really there? Is life so busy that you don't have time to pray properly? Well, the program that starts tomorrow night at 7 o'clock called you're on mute you're on mute it's a program that is here of seven days of a prayer revival we start tomorrow evening and every evening until next sabbath at seven o'clock just for one hour we're going to come back together and revive the power of prayer because prayer brings power to your life to your homes and to your churches and to the wider community. God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then he will hear from heaven. So what this week to be a week of revival, of prayer revival, of motivating your prayer life, of seeing God in different lights, of taking you off mute and bringing you into a close relationship with God himself. It promises to be a great week of prayer and revival. Our speaker is Pastor Ray Patrick, and he'll also be here next Sabbath for our final sessions. That'll be 11.15 and also 3 o'clock. So please, please, please clear your diaries for this this week, 7 till 8 every evening, starting from tomorrow night, all being well. We're going to pray and pray and pray and grow in strength. If you want your prayer to be spe special, spectacular, fabulous, and close to God, I encourage you to come off mute and come into a time of prayer and power. God bless you. See you tomorrow night all being well. Now on the poster on the screen, you'll notice there's two accesses to the program. We have a YouTube access and also a Zoom access. We're asking you that if you want to be part of the congregation, then please go through the Zoom access. If you choose not to do that, then go through the YouTube access, okay? So those will be on screen and be part of the, of the congregation for the pastor, Patrick. Choose the Zoom access. Otherwise, go through YouTube. Whatever means you go on, you will be blessed in a time of prayer and power for your lives 
and for the community about you. God bless you. See you tomorrow being well at 7 p.m., God willing. Thank you. At only 19 years old, Arthur Allam sensed God calling him to serve in China. This was only a year after he joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Even though his own relationship with Jesus was still new and growing, for him the call to go to China was just as definite as the call to keep the Sabbath. He decided to attend Avondale College to prepare for his life of mission service. At Avondale, Arthur connected with two people who would be essential in his life. The first was a young woman named Ava. She became his wife and future mission partner. Second was Dr. Harry Miller, a pioneer Adventist missionary to China. Dr. Miller wrote to Arthur and described the work there. He encouraged him to come serve as a missionary. To raise money for traveling, Arthur sold literature in New Zealand as soon as the college year was over. Arthur and Ava married only a month before they sailed to China in 1906. The couple's first assignment was working in the health clinic and printing office overseen by Dr. Miller. The Alums immediately started dressing like their new neighbors and learning to speak Mandarin. They found the new language difficult to learn, but they were determined because they knew it was critical to their mission. Day after day they practiced until they were fluent in Mandarin. Arthur even became an interpreter. Learning a new language was only the first challenge this missionary couple faced. The second was malaria. Both became ill at one point or another, and Arthur even contracted malaria three times. Still, they were committed to serving the people, primarily through publishing work and education. In August 1911, Arthur reported that in the year before, the North Central China Mission had 64 church members. That number had since grown to over 100 and was still growing. Arthur said, in a work like this, there is no room for discouragement. Arthur and Eva had three boys while serving in China. <laughs> Eva stayed busy caring for her family, as well as the people they were trying to reach. She taught Sabbath school, led the young people's society, and held Bible studies with women twice a week. For 17 years, Arthur and Ava's family served the Chinese people. Hi. Hello. Hi. Every Hello. day they tried to share the love of Jesus with even just one person. When Arthur gave a report to the General Conference about the work in China, he highlighted the continual need for missionaries to reach those who did not know Jesus. He said, we long for power to stir the multitudes of China as they have never been stirred in days past. We are seeking with you for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit for service. Today, the mission offerings send and equip missionaries all over the world. Your support helps the Adventist Church answer the Great Commission. Because of the mission offerings, missionaries have the opportunity to take the love of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Daria. Cathy Bouldeau is our lead on the domestic program here in the UK. On the 23rd of March, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, said that the fallout from COVID-19 would affect the UK for many years to come. Poverty, health inequalities, economic challenges, as well as the rise in mental health issues are part of the new pandemic in the United Kingdom. So where is ADRA in all of this? And what are we doing to help the UK's most vulnerable people? As well as working abroad, we have a domestic programme called I Am Urban. And the I Am Urban initiative seeks to work with community grassroots hubs 
up and down the country and the Republic of Ireland to support the UK's most vulnerable. We do this in partnership with Adventist Community Services. In 2020, we were able to support 100,000 people who were suffering through food banks, mental health programs, youth oriented programs, as well as distributing food and PPE. With the support of Barclays Bank, the Trans European Division, and donations, we were able to get the work done right here in the UK. I have one meal a day. Provided my children have three, I'll have one meal if I'm lucky. This is the reality of poverty in the UK. Often invisible, always corrosive. Everyone said, don't cry in front of her, but it's very hard when you live in the same room. But what happens when COVID batters already struggling families? And what are we doing to turn the tide? This has been serving here since June 2020. Was born out of COVID, but we are seeing increased use of the food bank. Um, yesterday we did about, we had about 71 people and 26 of them were new who had, a, you know, weren't our regulars. And, um, and we gave her about 80, and we gave her about 87 bags of food, yeah. And what sort of people are your clients? Right, so we've got mainly, uh, well, immigrants, so we've got Bulgarians, we've got Turks, we've got English, we've got Asians, yes. so it's the whole mix we've got. Plenty of greens here, plenty of veg, so it's a wholesome meal. You know? I actually started volunteering during the first lockdown. So that would have been about either April or May. It was just a weird time. I didn't have to worry about work. And I just thought, what can I do? And there was a call for help. So I just answered it. Yes, yes. None of us are professionals. I'm not sure, by the way. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're all, we're all amateurs, you know, but we enjoy cooking. All of us yeah, enjoy, yeah, cooking. Yeah, enjoy cooking, so um, so we so just sort of try and talent. extend it. Yeah, we are using our talent. So. Okay. Thanks. We want them to have a good, to enjoy the meal, and to have the, all the goodness in the food, you know? So we're having Chinese today because our Mauritian contingent are cooking, and they sort of always like to bring a, a different... Uh, flavour or variety to it so well if there's a need for it to continue to exist then i would like us as an organization to continue to do what we can to help people in the area <laughs>
30 years after the death of Wycliffe, at the Council of Constance in Germany, he was declared to be a heretic. A decree was made to dig up his bones and burn them to ashes. At that time, the Bishop of Lincoln was a former friend of his and he delayed in acting on this request for five years. He moved out the area and the next one who came in also vacillated for eight years before finally succumbing to this demand and dug up the bones and burned them. After burning his bones, they threw the ashes into the River Swift. But the significance of this gruesome act and the symbolism it would come to later represent, they could not have imagined. The River Swift flows into the River Avon. The River Avon flows into the Bristol Channel. And the Bristol Channel eventually flows into the Atlantic Ocean. And so symbolically, the effect of his work spread around the whole world. He is called the morning star of the Reformation because he was the beginning in a chain of events that once started became unstoppable. John Wycliffe gave to the Christian church perhaps the greatest gift possible, the Bible. And once given, the light would begin to shine and the darkness would be peeled away. John Wycliffe's work is key in our Christian heritage, for at the center of our faith is the Bible. Never underestimate the extent of the work that you do. John Wycliffe was called here to Lutterworth, a small, quiet country town, or probably back then, just a village. If any of us were called here to this town today, we might think it's not good enough, or not big enough, or not prestigious enough but he faithfully did the work that God had called him to do and gave to the Christian church perhaps the greatest gift possible. Wherever you are, use the gifts and the talents that God has given you, for you never know how far your influence may spread.
house, wherever you may be. Um, just before we start our praise and worship, I ask that you bow your heads with me as we invite the Holy Spirit to uh, worship with us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us through another week and allowing us to see a wonderful Sabbath day, Lord. Um, whatever our weeks may have been, we are all gathered here, Lord, to praise your name. I pray that our praise and our worship is acceptable in our sight, in your sight, Lord. And I pray that we feel your presence as we give you praise. All these things I ask in your name, I pray. Amen. 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 Right, we're going to go straight in with our song service. I hope you guys are joining in from your living rooms, your bedrooms, wherever you may be. First song we're going to sing is Don't Forget the Sabbath, the Lord your God has made, has blessed. Sabbath day, and now it's time we celebrate that our God lives. We serve a risen Savior. Oh, yeah, He's amen. in the world today. Amen. He's in my heart. Amen. He's in your heart. Yes, the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's go. He lives. He's living. I know that he is living. 
that they serve a great God? Amen. 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 Next song Hallelujah. just talks about how great our God is.
part with us in praise and worship. Um, I hope you guys lifted your voices from where you were. Thank you. The reading is taken from Psalms 33, verse 6 to 9. It reads, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them with the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the death in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you. I hope you've had a good week. Welcome to the hour of worship. We've had a challenging week this week. Um, we've lost two of our members this week. We've lost Brother Keith Johnson and we've lost Sister Swaby. I encourage you to remember them in your prayers. Remember their family in your prayers as they go through this time of mourning and separation. Now, we've been looking at the book of Genesis, and this morning we'll be spending a little time looking at the doctrine of creation. I invite you to bow your heads with me while we pray. Father, may your Holy Spirit now take charge of this service. Take charge of my lips and my tongue, that they may speak your words with clarity and love. I pray that our ears will be open to hear your words and that we will take it to heart and listen to you and follow where you want to lead us. We ask in your holy name. Amen. My wife and I very often watch the TV program called Long Lost Family, where we see families searching for um, their parents, Children who were placed in adoption or who've lost loved ones going around spending 20, 30, 40, 60, 70 years looking for their loved ones. Why did they have this desperate need to find their loved ones? Because all of us have a desire to know our roots. It is deeply embedded in all of us. Very often when they discover or when they meet their family and discover their roots, they become totally different people, filled with feelings of adequacy and happiness. In the same way, most of humanity have lost its sense of who they are. We do not know what our roots are. We do not know where we've come from. You see, we live in a world where we are a people who are committed to believing two divergent views as to where the human family comes from. Um, historically, we've all believed that a God of some sort made human beings and made the heavens and the earth. But since the so-called enlightenment of the 19th century, we've come to a situation where we now, with the advent of the doctrine of evolution, believe that we are here by accident. We are simply a little blob that came up in time. We, um, evolution effectively is our father and natural selection is our mother. Based on this evolutionary view, we are simply seen as an accident in time, just a blob inhabiting a little period of time and space, and we are here today and gone tomorrow. As a result of this kind of view, 
Many take the attitude of the old Romans who say, well, since we are going to die, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But the Bible gives a very different set of perspectives on who we are, as to where we came from, as to why we are here, as to whom we belong to, and where we are going. And this is summarized in the doctrinal summary in the Seventh-day Adventist um, teachings. And one of our teachings is based on belief number six, the doctrine of creation. And it says, God is creator of all things. Uh, and as revealed, and has revealed in Scripture, the authentic account of his creative activity. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and all living things upon the earth, and rested the seventh day of that first week. Thus, he established the Sabbath as a perpetual reminder, or a perpetual memorial of his completed creative work. The first man and woman were made in the image of God as the crowning work of his creation and were given dominion over the world and charged with the responsibility to care for it. When the world was finished, it was very good, declaring the glory of God. Now, the Bible's account, therefore, is very simple. It tells us in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, what happened? God created the heavens and the earth. In Exodus 20, verse 11, the fourth commandment continues. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is. So in a mere six days, we see a change from a world without form and void. Of our planet was then, by the word of God, adorned with clear, bright colors and shapes and fragrances, putting together, creating a wonderful world as a home for plants and animals and for human beings, the crowning act of God's creation. So clearly we are being told in Genesis that we are not an accident in time. But you and I are the deliberate, thoughtful creation of an omnipotent God and loving Heavenly Father. We are unique in creation. We are special. We are loved. And I'd like you to reflect on the simple matter. That from the beginning of time until the end of time, there, Alvin, there will never be another you. You are a unique genetic agglomeration of traits that made you. And no matter how long time continues for, there will never be another you. And that's an amazing prospect. No wonder the Bible says, before you were formed, God had you in his mind. While you were in your mother's womb, God designed you. God brought you here for a purpose. So in, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible records the creation account in these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was previously disorganized and was called the void covered with darkness. But on day one, God said, let there be light and there was light. Just reflect on that. Where before there was darkness, suddenly there was light enveloping this globe. On day two, God divided the waters, creating an atmospheric blanket surrounding this planet. And, be, and in this you had the oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen and other gases mixed together that were suitable for life. And below it, you had the waters covering the deep. On the third day, God separated the waters from the land, gathering the waters into one place, creating seas and rivers and lakes. 
And then the Bible says that after that, God covered the land with grass and the hills and shores and valleys with luxuriant vegetation. We see the land plants bearing seed according to their kind and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kind, according to Genesis 1 and verse 2. On day 4, we see God establishing the sun the moon and the stars for signs and seasons and for days and years. The sun was to govern the day and the moon to cover to govern the night. God also created the birds and marine life on the fifth day. He created them according to their kind, an indication that the creatures he created would consistently reproduce after their own kinds. And this is cr crucial to understand that Though the, the evolution theory tells you, otherwise, a dog will always produce a dog as an offspring. You might have one looking like a bulldog, or a chihuahua, or a great dane, but it is always a dog. They produce offspring after their kind. Then, as the crowning and then on this on the sixth day god created the higher forms of animal life he said let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind cattle creeping things and beasts of the earth each according to their kind so we had the mammals we had the huge reptile reptiles dinosaurs and all those creatures that god designed then as the crowning act of creation on day six Genesis 1 verse 27, it says, God made man in his own image. Now, it is crucial to reflect on what the Bible says and compare it with the other view. You see, in Genesis 1.31, it says, and God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So we have two competing views. One version says that one day, out of nothing, caused by nothing, suddenly something came about. So by pure chance, space and time and matter simply came into being. No one made it. No one designed it. It just happened. So here we have two competing views. That nature simply came about by accident or God created it. So out of nothing and with the aid of nothing, everything came into being. That is what evolution says. Or we have in Psalm 33, 6 and 9, we are being told, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The question is, which one makes more sense to you? Which one makes more sense? And does it make a difference? what you believe. Scripture makes it clear that the whole of human civilization and the present state of the universe is the outworking of a battle between the forces of good and evil, between Christ and Satan, the cultural battles between atheism and Christianity, between belief and unbelief is part of the battle between the forces of good and evil. Furthermore, what you believe and what I believe is of utter importance. It affects how we live. It affects our values. It affects the men and women and boys and girls that we are. If there is no God and we are simply here by accident, a little flash in the pan of time and we eat, live and die and reproduce, then it does not matter how we live or what we do. Because when we die, 
I am blotted out. That's the end of it forever and ever and ever. But if there is a God who is the source of all goodness and who will hold all his children to account for how they live, then it is crucially important. It is crucially important then that we know how we live. Because the Bible makes it clear that there will be a day of judgment when God will call us to give an account for how we live. So in this crisis of the ages, each person is making a decision for life or death, for heaven or for hell, for Christ or Satan. Now, you need to understand that the whole business of the pushing of evolution in schools and in our culture is not by accident. It is part of the demonic attack upon God and his word. Now, let, let, let's ask a question. This building, what would you say is the most important part of the building? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the structure of the building. Would you say the most important part is the roof or somewhere else? The foundations. So the foundation of this building is the most important part. It does not matter how much money you spend on the sides and everything else. If the foundations are not good, if the foundations are not secure, it will tumble down. Now you need to understand that the foundation of the Bible is the book of Genesis. The foundation of the Bible is Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Without that, nothing else makes sense. Nothing else makes sense. And we need to see that there is this concentrated attempt to undermine and destroy the belief in creation and in the fact that a God made us, that God made Adam and Eve perfect, that they rebelled against God and sinned. They're seeking to undermine that because if that is undermined, then nothing else in the Bible really makes sense. And that is crucial. And therefore, Revelation 14, 6 and 7 tells us that God, seeing the issues, has sent one final message of warning to this last generation. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. It is important to understand that this message has relevance for this generation like no other generation. In every other age, people believed in God, whether it was in Allah or the um, or, or one of the Hindu religions or whatever, they believed in something. But in Western civilization, in Western Christianity, we came up with this new theory that says, well, everything came up by accident and you do not need to believe in a God anymore. And, and that is where we are at. And so here it is that in our educational system, we are undermining and destroying a belief in God as creator. And let us look at it. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, we see clearly where an attempt would have been made to wipe out God's truth. But the Bible says that that beast that would seek to do that would receive a deadly wound. And so during the Middle Ages, attempts were made to destroy the Bible. But the more they tried to do it, is the more men held on to the Bible with all their energy. And so the devil changed his strategy. Rather than simply attacking the Bible in an outward way, 
it attacks the foundation. And so basically, what are our children taught in school today? That the Bible is made up of myths, fairy tales, and legends. What part is a myth? Genesis 1 to 11 are mythical tales. So there was no creation. There was no Adam and Eve. There was no fall into sin. There was no Noah and the flood. All of those things are mythical tales. Now, if that is so, and we evolved from primitive creatures coming up towards what we are today, then it means then that sin is really not sin. Because what we are, we are on this journey going from simple to more complex. And the longer life goes on, the better we will become. But when we look at society, to our shame, I would say we are going in the opposite direction. We are going from more perfect to imperfect, from more godly and righteous to be more unrighteous. And so the Bible makes it clear that when Satan tried to wipe out the church, he failed. And then suddenly we had the situation where we had the Protestant Reformation. Men got the Bible in their own languages. The British and Foreign Bible Society and the American Bible Society translated the Bible in all kinds of languages and gave it to everybody all over the world. People had the Bible and were reading it. So Satan had to do another thing. And so rather than taking the Bible away, he seeks to undermine the Bible so that people will keep the Bible on their bookshelves, gathering dust, and not read it. And there are many of us Seventh-day Adventists sitting on our churches and in our homes today who do not really read the Bible. Maybe we take it up on a Sabbath morning, dust it off to do a little something, but otherwise, so many of us, especially even our young people and children, are becoming spiritually illiterate. Indeed, Daniel, Revelation 12, 17 says, And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So if Satan could destroy the Bible, he would possibly defeat the church and its mission. But despite his best efforts, he failed. In, Dan, in Revelation 11, verse 3, we see a prediction about two witnesses identified as the Old and New Testaments that prophesied in sackcloth and ashes for 1,260 days, or 1,260 prophetic years. And during that time, the Bible continued to do its work, but, but in hardship. But then we see in verse 8 and 9 that these two prophets were killed and for three and a half days their bodies were exposed in the streets. And we understand that as being the attack on the Bible, particularly in the French Revolution, when um, they, dis they banned the Bible effectively in French society. But after the French Revolution came to an end, Humanism got a real shot. But, and then the Bible went forward and evangelization went all over the world. But Satan's attack, as I said, came in a new guise. Satan's attack was now to undermine scripture, undermine its authority. And very often the attack comes from the church itself. So... If Genesis 1 and 2, or 1 to 12, are fairy tale or myths or legend, then the issue is that same sex does not matter. You see, where does marriage come from? Who invented marriage? God. The Bible says God made man for woman and woman for man. And God said be fruitful and multiply. But in our culture, we are saying now, so long as you want to have fun, have fun. With he, she, it, or the old lady, or whatever you want to do, have fun. So basically, if we undermine the Bible, same sex does not matter. But if we uphold the Bible, same sex matters. Because God says, it is against my will and purpose. 
If we undermine Genesis 1 to 11, then abortion and euthanasia doesn't matter. Because here it is, the Bible says that every life is precious. God created Adam and Eve and he established the system where man and woman cooperate with him in creating new life. I was speaking to a young lady the other day and burying her baby um, who died at six months into uterine and um, lovely little formed baby. But when she got pregnant, the guy said, get rid of it. Now, now we're talking about two people in our church. Get rid of it. And for months and months, he's at her to get rid of it, and she refused. Well, unfortunately, there were some complications, and the baby died. But the point I'm making simply is this. When is it that for Christians, suddenly abortion becomes an issue? Why? Because we've abandoned scripture. Scripture doesn't matter. Every human being is a gift from God. And it is our duty to protect human life. When you abandon Genesis, Sabbath doesn't matter. The Bible says God made the heavens and the earth in six days, rested on the seventh day, setting us an example. But when you abandon Genesis, Sabbath doesn't matter. When you abandon Genesis, suicide and mass shootings does not matter because when you die, that's the end of it. There is no coming back. The only reason why these things matter or are wrong is because God forbids it in Scripture. But if we get rid of God and the Bible, then in it, it is each man's opinion. As the Bible says, each man does what seemeth good in his own sight. But the Bible says the evidence for God is everywhere. God's fingerprints, God's footprints are everywhere. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Nature speaks eloquently of God, his power in creating and sustaining the world in which we live. Contemporary man willfully rejects the clear evidence of God's creative activity, choosing instead to believe a lie and to worship and to worship the creature rather than the creator. Indeed, in Romans chapter 2, verse 19, um, Romans puts it this way: that the evidence for God's creative power is everywhere. Romans 1, verse 19. This is how it puts it. It says, it says in Romans, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifested to them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1, 18 through to 22. So let us get it clear. God in the beginning said, let there be a world. And where before there was emptiness and nothing, suddenly there was a world. For by the word of the Lord's were the heavens created. He created it, as the, theor as the philosophers say, ex nihilo. That is, he created it out of nothing, without depending on any pre-existing matter. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So all of nature was designed and created by him. So, the God, of, the God of heaven made everything. He spoke and it was done. But why did he create it? 
If God knew sin would come, if God knew that you would have murderers and child molesters, why people who would kill him on the cross, why did he do it? My dear friend I hear is going to become a father. And I'm very happy for him. The, 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 the point I'm making by making that reference is this. Children are not easy work. Children give you heartache, headache, gray hairs, and all kinds of things. And yet, and yet, though we know that those things will come, we still go ahead and have children. Why? Because we love them. And there is this joy that comes to us in seeing offspring from our bodies whom we can love and nurture and care for. In the same way, why did God make man? Knowing all he knew? Because God simply got pleasure from doing it. God simply gets pleasure from seeing his children whom he can nurture and care for and love. Indeed, Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, God created man. He said, I created man for my pleasure. That is Isaiah 43 verse 7. I created man for my pleasure. In, indeed, Jeremiah 17 verse 3 says, I have, that, that God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Wherefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So God made man for love because he loves us. God chose to create creatures like himself that reflected his character and personality. God created man with a mind to think and act and to be creative and to rule in this earthly sphere as God rules over the universe. He also designed humankind with the capacity to experience the joy of creating new life, to be like God as a loving, beneficent ruler over our earthly sphere as he rules over the universe. But sin invaded and marred it all. Many questions have been asked by skeptics of the biblical account of Genesis 1. First and foremost, it must be established that Genesis 1 is not a science book. Genesis 1 is not a science book. But whatever Genesis 1 and the Bible says that has a scientific basis does make sense. Whatever the Bible says that has a scientific basis will match up with real science. The Genesis account describes the literal days of creation as 24-hour periods. Many people say, oh, it must be a thousand years because Peter says a day in the Lord's sight are like a thousand years. But sister, if I say you look like a something, um, it doesn't mean that you are that something. It is a simile. So, in the, so when the Bible says that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day, it simply says that God doesn't live in time. Time doesn't have any relevance to God. So Hebrews 11:6 6 says, By faith we believe that God created the universe. So, it is crucial then for us to accept that God made man on day six, that God gave man rulership over the creation, and then later on in Genesis chapter two, God describes how he made man. So the first um, account of creation describes the created order of all things, where each day laid the groundwork for the next, and so on. The second creation, um, creation of man's story describes man's place in creation. It begins with, these are the generations of Adam. And it established the fact that everything that went before was for the benefit of Adam or for mankind. So the creation days are 24-hour periods. Day seven was designated for rest and spiritual refreshment. Why? Because God worked 
one day, two day, three day. Did God rest because he was tired? No. God simply was setting an order for human beings to follow. So God said, work for six days and rest seventh day. So the Sabbath was not incidental, but was part of the original created order. The Sabbath, Jesus said in Mark 2.27, was made for man, for the benefit of man, and not man for the Sabbath. Now, let's, let's look at how that, the fact that Sabbath was built into the human constitution. Listen to this. During the French Revolution, as part of their scientific advancement, they abandoned the seven-day cycle of the week and established a 10-day cycle of the week. The records tell us that by the second and third week in Paris and in the cities of France, the horses pulling the carriages begin to drop down dead in the streets. Why? Because we are made to work for a certain time and to rest, giving our body the chance for re rejuvenation. Now, in Britain and in most societies, the law says you should work for a certain number of hours per week, around 40 hours per week. Why? Why is the law, law getting involved in your business? Because they noticed in the 17 and 1800s that when people worked too many hours, their production decreased. The quality of their production decreased. But not just that, the, uh, the incidence of accidents increased. So what is that telling us? That God made us to work for six days or about 40 hours per week and to rest for rejuvenation. So that is telling us that that is written in our genetic makeup. Do you understand that? Not just in the human genetic makeup, but in the animal's genetic makeup, as we saw with the horses in France. That's why God said that even your donkey, in the fourth commandment, even your donkey should rest on the seventh day. Because God designed that human beings should work and rest. So even there, we see evidence of God's fingerprints in creation. Now, the other question is, where did the seven-day week come from? Uh, how did man de um, decide on a seven-day week? How did we decide on the year? Because we noticed that it takes 365 and a quarter days for the sun to make a a complete circle for, um, for the earth to make a complete circuit of the sun. So, for example, in Stonehenge, they notice that the shadow is at this place and it takes 365 days for the shadow to come back to the same place. And so that is how they calculated the year. How did we decide on, the moon, on how long a month was? Because we notice that it takes 28 days for the new moon to come back around. So those are fixed in nature. But how do we account for the seven-day week? There is no celestial event. The only reason why we have a six-day week, a seven-day week, is because God in Genesis said, I made the heavens and the earth in six days and rested the seventh day, and you should do the same. Oh, s some um, sh smart um, um, researchers say, oh, well, it must have been very early men began to go to market every seventh day. Well, why go to market every seventh day? Why didn't they go to market every, every eighth day? When man wants to ignore God's word, they try to be smart and inventive. But go to the word of God. Look at nature. Look at your body. And it tells you that God is in charge. So, going back to evolution. If evolution is true, then there is no God. Then Genesis account is a lie. 
if evolution is true, then there was no Adam and Eve, no fall of man. And the rest of the biblical revelation is based on concepts um, with a concept like God becoming man in Jesus Christ and living and dying for our sins. That doesn't make any sense. If evolution is true, then there is no such thing as sin. Since it is in the Bible, sin is defined as rebellion against God. But any casual reading of Genesis makes it clear that God, it was intended to be understood as real, as historical, as describing what happened. In every culture, in every culture, no matter how primitive, it might seem there are tales similar to the Genesis stories. And one of the things that anthropologists have discovered, they go to Papua New Guinea, they go to China, they go to the, um, to, to, to the American Indians, they go to South America, to the Polynesian Islands. Everywhere they go, every, every people had their own stories about creation, about the fall of man, and about the flood. Where did they get it from before they ever saw the Bible? Because it happened in the early years of the human family. And those stories were so embedded in human culture that it was passed down verbally from generation to generation. Now, why did God create the heavens and the earth? Simply because he wanted to have you and I to be his children. Some people think that because, Ad, because Satan and one third of the angels rebelled against God and were cast out of heaven, God needed some new people to replenish heaven. And so he created man to be those people. But if God knew that they were going to rebel, then why go ahead with it? Because God decided that even though they rebelled, he would himself become a human being. He would live and die among them, providing an opportunity for them to come back to him and become fit citizens for eternal life. Because the amazing truth of Revelation is this. The Bible says, where is going to be the headquarters of the universe? The Bible says, God will dwell where? With man. The Bible says God will make a new heavens and a new earth. The new Jerusalem will descend from heaven to earth and God shall dwell with man. Therefore, this earth, renewed, redeemed, purified, recreated with those faithful men and women who have loved and served and followed God will become the new center of the universe. Why did God do it? To reveal his love, to reveal his glory. God is glorified when we seek to emulate his, char his character, then fulfilling the purpose for which we are created. The second reason for creating man was that through Adam, God wanted to populate the world. Isaiah 45 verse 8 says, God wanted man with the ability, God created man with the ability to procreate and instituted marriage, giving mankind the amazing privilege of cooperating with him in creating new life. God commanded humanity to go forth be fruitful and multiply. God created the Sabbath as an antidote to idolatry. God's creatorship distinguishes him from all other gods. You see, we have mountains, we have sun, we have rivers, but all those things were made. All those things were made. But God, the creator, who is non-material, because remember that God is not matter. God is not made of matter like you and me. Even though Jesus became a man, notice the Bible says he emptied himself and became a man. God is not matter because matter was made by God in the beginning. And the Bible says that in the world to come, 
we shall be changed. The Bible says we shall receive a new body, a glorious body like the resurrected body Jesus had when he came out of the tomb. Now, the creation and the Sabbath was, was designed by God to, so that men could worship him and serve him. Oh, come, let us worship. Let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Acknowledging creation makes us realize how amazing God is. You know, I, I was 24 years old, and I was working as a teacher um, in one of our schools in Jamaica. And um, I hadn't seen my maternal grandmother for, 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 for maybe about three months. And I went to see her, and she stood up in the yard, and she looked down the path and saw me coming. And, you know, she was about 80 at the time. And she put up her hand and began to jump like this. And, um, and she ran, and she came, and she grabbed me, and she hugged me, and she kissed me. Even thinking about it made me have goosebumps today. Because I felt love. I felt I was special. I was important. In the same way, when I look at God and think about how God feels about me in giving me life, in, in providing for me day by day, in providing Jesus Christ to give me eternal life, I have to bow down. Bow down and worship him as the amazing God that he is. And that is why God is saying that this message must be given to the whole world, calling men to stop worshiping money, to stop worshiping pleasure and excitement and the things of this age. We must worship God as creator of heaven and earth and as the one who made the seas and the springs of water. That is why the church is here. That is why the church is here. Now, my brothers and sisters, we then need to consider that God said to man, look after the world. But we are killing the world. All this issue about, about global warming and that one, we, we are killing the world. And we are bearing the consequences of our crazy lifestyle. But God said, you must be a steward of your own life, of your own body, of your own time, but also steward of the world around. God says, work for six days. So if you are a lazy man or a lazy woman, you can't truly be a true Christian because God says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. You can't come and worship every Sabbath and not work. And God says further, if you don't work, you mustn't eat. Creation story shows that rather than being here by accident of evolution, everything is here was created by God for a purpose. Humanity was created for relationships with God and with his fellow men. We understand that we were made for a reason and life becomes meaningful. The emptiness and dissatisfaction that many experience vanishes when God enters the picture. So in summary, it is important that we realize Colossians 1.17, for by him, that is by Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. God's creative power is presently involved in the act of redemption. God is seeking to recreate in us a character like that of Christ, making us fit citizens for the kingdom of eternal life. God, whose power hurled galaxies and universes into place, wants to change you and to change me. The same God who said to the leper, be clean, and he was clean. The same God who raised up people who were crippled is the same God who raised the dead body of Lazarus, is the same God who says, I 
want to make you into a new man and a new woman. So let us never lose sight of the issues at stake. The dragon, the devil, is angry with God's church. He is angry with the woman and is seeking to destroy God's people and to create havoc in the world. But God is saying, I chose you. I created you for a purpose and you must follow me. So in summary, God in the beginning made the heavens and the earth. We are not here by accident. The universe did not make itself because everything that exists was made by somebody. And the Bible says the universe was made by God. Psalm 33, 6 and 9. God spoke and the sheer power of his will. You see, um, Einstein's equation says energy is equal to mass time the speed of light squared, which tells you that energy can be converted into matter and matter can be converted into energy. But it is telling us that God, simply by the energy of his will, simply said, let it be, and there it was. And it is telling us that God modeled the world and made it suitable as a home for you and me. It tells us that, yes, the enemy of God, the enemy of your soul came in and wreaked, wreaked havoc, but God is still working his purpose out. And in Jesus Christ, God is seeking to establish men and women who can become fit citizens for eternal life. And the purpose of your life is not just to get married and have children and to get a nice car and house and children. Oh, no. It is to know God. It is to build a character like him so that we can become fit citizens to live with him for the ceaseless ages of eternity. God has a message of warning to give to, this, to the world, summarized in the first, second, and third angels' messages. And God wants you, God wants me, God wants us as his church to become the instruments through whom this message is given to the world. How shall they hear without a preacher? You say, well, I am shy. Oh, I don't know as much. Look, God is almighty. God can use anything. If God spoke through a donkey to a prophet, then God can speak through any of you, any of us, to do his amazing work. So let us acknowledge God rules. God is in charge. God wants to live in you. God wants to work through you. God wants to achieve his purpose in creation through you. But remember, the devil is busy. The devil knows the joy of eternal life. The, the, he knows the joy and the beauty of heaven. And he doesn't want you to get it. And above all, he wants to hurt God by messing you up. Don't let him have his way. God has gained the victory. And you have nothing to be afraid of. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. May we take to heart that we were, are not here by accident, but we are here by your, your divine design and power. May we submit our lives to you. May we listen to your word. May we follow your word. May we educate ourselves as to the issues relating to who you are. May we teach our children the truth about creation, giving them the intellectual wherewithal to stand firm and believe that God is God, the creator of heaven and earth. And Lord, when you shall come, may we hear from your lips, well done, my son, well done, my daughter, come ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world is my prayer in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.
Grace, keep us safe. This is our ex joy. Let's sing as we leave. Final song we're gonna sing He's worthy, God's worthy, Almighty Creator, Alpha Omega, beginning and the end. Amen. Take this joy of the song with you as you go through your week. Take God with you and share God. Amen.
from the top. And it is to God. He's worthy, God's worthy, almighty creator, alpha, omega, beginning and the end. Holy, holy Lord God almighty, which was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. 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 Blessings and glory. Blessings and glory, wisdom and
size of a mustard seed can move mountains, and nothing's impossible with faith. Often times we realize the smallest things that count. We're talking about faith the size of a mustard seed is enough to move the doubt. Faith that grows with obedience will part the deep sea. Now faith that grows in prayer. Your faith, your faith brought you out. Take it up. 